The Mughal dynasty is a fascinating bunch. These leaders of one of the most significant empires in the history of the Indian subcontinent are all pretty much very famous figures. Emperors like Akbar, who I've already made an episode on, um, Jahangir and Aurangzeb are all very famous historical figures, and sometimes for very different reasons. But one of the most famous of the Mughal royals is one who was never actually an emperor himself. He was a prince who, much like his predecessor Akbar, is not remembered for political reasons, but for his explorations of religious and intellectual um, pursuits. Being an initiate and teacher of the Qadri Sufi order, as well as deeply and seriously exploring the religious traditions of the Hindus. This figure represents the fascinating ways that religious traditions can meet and, and be in dialogue with each other without necessarily being subsumed into each other. So in this episode, let's talk about Prince Dara Shukul. Dara Shuko was born in 1615 in India and as the son of Shahab Din Muhammad Khuram, more famously known later as Shah Jahan, the emperor who built the magnificent Taj Mahal. Indeed, Dara's mother was Mumtaz Mahal, the queen in whose honor the Taj Mahal was built after her death. Dara was thus the grandson of the emperor Jahangir and great-grandson of the emperor Akbar. The early years of Dara and his siblings were tumultuous, being caught up in bloody struggles of succession between his father, uncles, and grandfather, a common theme in the Mughal dynasty and one that Dara himself would experience firsthand towards the end of his life. Eventually, though, his father won the War of Succession and was crowned the new Mughal Emperor under the name Shah Jahan. And after this, Dara spent much of his life with the privileges of a prince of a mighty empire, together with his siblings, including his sister Jahanara, whom he was very close with for the rest of his life and shared many spiritual explorations with, as well as his famous, or perhaps infamous, younger brother Aurangzeb. Dara was clearly the favorite, though. He was Shah Jahan's eldest son, and the father doesn't exactly hide the fact that Dara was definitely considered heir apparent. We can see indications of this in the fact that when Dara married his beloved wife Nadira in 1633, the celebrations were grand beyond anything that had ever been seen before, whereas the marriages of his brothers Aurangzeb and Shuja were, while still major events of course, still meager by comparison. We might also notice that while Shah Jahan would often send his other sons, Aurangzeb in particular, to the far reaches of the empire to constantly fight wars or defend its borders, Dada was mostly kept at home in the security of the palaces, something that some historians theorize might have contributed to his later downfall. The relationship between Dada and his sister was always warm and close for the rest of their lives, but he wasn't always on good terms with his brothers. They grew up together, of course, but very early on in their adult life we start to see uh, tensions between the different brothers. Uh, Aurangzeb and the other younger brothers were probably jealous of the favoritism shown towards Dada, and while the relationship between these brothers generally would of course wax and wane um, during their lives, they we can sort of see a, a gradual decline, which eventually would lead to complete disaster, but we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves here. Because it isn't really Dada's political life that we are interested in here, even if it does serve as an important backdrop. Instead, what is so interesting about Dara Shuko was his intense piety and devotion to Islam as expressed through Sufism. Now what's important to remember here is that Sufism, known as Tasawwuf in Arabic, served as a kind of majority expression of Islam at this time. Islam and Sufism was basically synonymous. The different Sufi orders that flourished in the region at the time, the Chishti, Qadri and Naqshbandi being three examples, and its different spiritual masters was the focal point of devotional practice. And all the famous emperors were deeply connected to these orders in some way. 
emperors like Akbar, Jahangir, and even Aurangzeb would visit the shrines of Sufi masters and engage in their teachings. One very common mistake in which this situation is presented is to picture Sufis on the one hand and then conservative orthodox ulama or Islamic scholars on the other who oppose it. There was no such dichotomy back then, it didn't exist. This is an anachronistic and inaccurate way of portraying the situation, taking a modern situation and projecting it backwards in history. Because in the absolute majority of cases, the so-called orthodox scholars were also Sufis. When we see certain Sufi practices or ideas being criticized, this isn't a debate between Sufis versus non-Sufi Orthodox Islam because no such dichotomy existed. Instead, these are debates and discussions that are held within a Sufi context. Sufis, in other words Muslims, disagreed on things. They had different ideas about what constituted correct Islamic or Sufi practice. This is an important point that will become relevant again later on in the discussion and we will return to it. Dara Shukur was a Muslim and it seems that early on in his life he became especially and intensely devoted to Sufism. Um, some stories suggest that this uh, devotion and this interest may have been sparked by a meeting with the famous Qadri Sufi Mian Mir who lived in Lahore at that time. Famous not only as a master of the Qadri Sufi order but also supposedly as the person who laid the foundation stone for the Sikh Golden Temple in Amritsar. Even though this story may or may not be historically true, it does kind of tell us something about the religious interactions between different religious traditions at the time, something that definitely will become relevant in the life story of Dara. It is said that the Emperor Shah Jahan visited Mian Mir in his Sufi lodge and brought the prince Dara with him. Um, these kinds of meetings with ascetics and uh, religious uh, figures such as Mian Mir were quite common at the time. Emperors would often visit these kinds of Sufi sages to receive their blessings or to engage in uh, spiritual discussions. In this case, it seems that Shah Jahan visited Mian Mir in order for the Sufi to help him cure an illness that Dara was uh, afflicted with, which he promptly did. And Dara himself seems to have become completely overwhelmed by this meeting and immediately becoming devoted to this great Sufi master. Dara would continue to visit Mian Mir many times and the great ascetic would teach him mystical secrets and Qadri practices in which the prince would engage. He was on his way to becoming a proper Sufi. Unfortunately, Dara's time as a disciple of Mian Mir was short as the master passed away in 1635, leaving the prince still a novice on the Sufi path and without a master. Mian Mir would continue to play a major role in Dara's spiritual and mystical development, even from the grave, as we will see, but he could no longer serve as a living guide in the physical world. But Dara's destiny was by now firmly set. He was to dedicate the rest of his life primarily to the Sufi path and to the Qadri order in particular. While he never gave up on his princely duties and the fact that he was to become the emperor, the majority of Dada's activities for the rest of his life would revolve around intellectual and spiritual pursuits. At this time, both Dada and his sister Jahanara started diving deep into Sufi literature, both classics and contemporary works. This included one of the most common and popular genres, the biographical or hagiographical writings, which describes the lives and stories of Sufi masters of the past. Many of the great Sufi authorities wrote such works, including the Nafahat al-Uns by Abdurrahman Jami, the Tadkirat al-Awliya by Fariduddin Athar, and the Ruh al-Quds by Ibn Arabi. And as a result of this, Dara and Jahanara both decided to write such hagiographical works of their own, which it is claimed they both finished on the same day, on the 21st of January 1640. Jahanara had become particularly attached and devoted to the Chishti order of Sufism and her work entitled the Muniz al-Arwa, the Confidant of Souls, was a compendium of stories about the great Chishti saints in particular. Now Dara's book, by the name Safina al Awliya, The Ship of God's Friends, was more ambitious in scope, retelling stories of Sufis from many different orders. Writing such a work of biographical material was a way to assert oneself as a participant in the Sufi tradition, something that both Dada and his sister were very interested in doing. And not too long after the death of Mian Mir, the prince found another master in the figure Mullah Shah Badakhshi. Mullah Shah resided in Kashmir and had been a student of Mian Mir after whose death he took on an increasingly central role. 
He had become famous as a Sufi who had reached an intense spiritual realization of the principle of Tawheed and Wahdat al-Wujud, or the unity of being. At once an authority on Islamic law and hadith, and an occasionally controversial figure for certain poetic utterances during moments of mystical union, Mulla Shah would play a decisive role in the lives of Dara Shuku and his sister Jahanara, both of whom would eventually become his devoted students, but not without some struggle. Dada first met Mullah Shah in 1640 at the age of 25, when he, together with the emperor and his entourage, visited Kashmir. Dada had of course heard of the master being connected to Mian Mir, and desperately wanted him to take the prince on as a student. Mullah Shah, however, seems to have despised worldly leadership and wanted to detach himself completely from any such connections. Being a prince, Dada was harshly rejected by the ascetic. After having approached the master, saying, quote, I am a seeker of God and have come to the threshold for spiritual guidance. Mullah Shah exclaimed, quote, What have I got to do with emperors and princes? I'm an ascetic with no desires. What sort of time is this to come and give me a headache and make trouble? Get lost and don't come again. Eventually, however, after repeated tries and some help from mutual friends, Mullah Shah agreed to take the prince on as a student, and Dada started an intense program of mystical practice during the months that he stayed in Kashmir. He was eventually initiated formally into the Qadri order by Mullah Shah, and it appears that the ascetic completely changed his mind on the prince, the two becoming very close and Mullah Shah admiring the devotion of his student, considering him among his foremost pupils. Dara seems to have progressed on the spiritual path unusually fast, and before he left Kashmir to go back home, Mullah Shah had given him the permission to teach. In other words, Dara had now become a Sufi teacher himself, an accomplished mystic who, as a result of that, had surpassed his predecessors of the Mughal dynasty, all of whom had been interested in Sufism and devoted to the Sufi saints and so on, but had never actually become official Sufi practitioners themselves. And this religious development continued for the rest of Dara's life. He continued to serve as a student for Mullah Shah, visiting him on several occasions and corresponding through letters when they were separated. But Dara would also start to teach himself and dedicated himself to developing his own approaches, writing works of Sufi literature, as well as engaging in debates and discussions with different people in the region. We really start to see Dara Shuka coming into his own as a Sufi personality and teacher as he starts having intense visionary experiences. Once in 1642, where he saw his master Mian Mir impose upon him an ecstatic experience of mystical union with God, and then another experience in 1645 in which he saw the Prophet Muhammad himself. In the words of the historian and scholar Supriya Gandhi, quote, Dara now saw the Prophet Muhammad. An unbroken chain of spiritual descent immediately became apparent to him. From the Prophet Muhammad, most beloved of God, the line of leadership went straight to Abdul Qadir Jilani, founder of the Qadri order, eventually reaching Mullah Shah, and through Mullah Shah to Dara Shuko himself. In the vision, the prince was then appointed to write a treatise showing the path to the divine. This treatise, which he finished in 1646 or 1647, was entitled the risala i haqnuma which can be translated to something like the Compass of Truth. As the quote suggested, this is a book that is meant to show the path to reaching the divine through explicating and explaining a number of spiritual and meditative practices of the Qadri order and general Sufi doctrines related to it. And it is a good idea to explore this treaty a bit deeper, since it is probably the best look into the actual teachings and philosophies that Dara Shuku adhered to. The treatise is primarily meant as a guide for meditative and spiritual practices, a few of which are actually described in great detail in the book. This is quite unusual for the time, especially because these kinds of mystical practices were usually kept secret and only divulged by a teacher to an initiated student. But Dara here seems to make a point to reveal these teachings, these, these practices, to anyone who reads his book. Which, granted, was probably quite a small elite audience, but still. The two primary meditative techniques that are described in the treatise are, according to its author, common practices in the Qadri Sufi order. And he's very careful to trace these practices back to the order's founder, Abdul Qadr al-Jilani, as well as even back to the Prophet Muhammad himself. 
These practices include, on the one hand, a technique of suspension of the breath, which includes several postures, and another practice that aims to hear a kind of primordial sound of existence, which, when heard, increases and takes over your entire being and plunges the mystic into an ecstatic uh, state. He calls this the Sultani Asgar and explains how tradition tells that this is the practice that the Prophet Muhammad would partake in in the Hira cave prior to revelation. And the sound that is heard, which is described as a kind of hum or of running water, a beehive or sometimes the ringing of bells, is the same as the famous sound that the Prophet is said to have always heard in connection to a new revelation from God. But the treatise also tells us a lot about Dara's more metaphysical or ontological positions. Generally, it is clear that Dara, like so many other Muslims at the time, follow the teachings or school associated with the Andalusian Sufi Ibn Arabi, which has become known as Wahdat al-Wujud, or the unity of being. He even alludes to this pretty clearly himself in the opening of the treatise, quote, by this, they might understand the essential meaning of all the great Sufi books, such as Al-Futuhat al makiyah and Fusuz al-Hikam by Ibn Arabi, and commentaries on them like the Savaneh of Ahmed Ghazali, Lawa'ih by Mawlana Jami, and Lama'at by Faqridin Iraqi. Here, he clearly connects himself with several scholars attributed to this school of thought, with the exception of Ahmed Ghazali, who lived before Ibn Arabi, so that doesn't make any sense, but still. I've dedicated full episodes to this school of thought, which you can check out, but it can be characterized as a form of monistic interpretation of Islam, where the only reality, reality itself in fact, is identified with God. All appearance in the created world is the reflection of God's infinite attributes. Having no being or existence in themselves, all created things are nothingness. Their being, or wujud, is God, and thus one and unified, just like God is. Dara shows his adherence to this philosophy by making several comparisons, like the classic one of created things being the waves in the ocean, the ocean itself being existence or God. He also compares it to ice and snow, different things which at the end of the day are made up of the same stuff, namely water. Quote, Consider the reality of water. When water is not bound, it is free of color and has no fixed form. But when water is bound in a solid, it assumes various forms, such as ice or snow or hail. Observe closely and decide for yourself whether or not ice, snow and hail consist of the same essential water, which is itself colorless and formless. Or the following statement, quote, If you imagine that a single mote of dust is separate from the divine essence, then you have lost the blessing of witnessing divine unity and mystical comprehension. But what is also really interesting about the Risale Haqnuma is the fact that it gives us the first indications of Dara's engagement with Indic thought and Hinduism in particular. Now, firstly and most clearly, a lot of the spiritual or meditative practices that are described even though Dara is, of course, very careful to trace them back to the Prophet Muhammad and his practices, and this might be a legitimate uh, connection, it's hard to say, but still, many of these practices have clear parallels in yogic practices that were common in the region at the time. We know that Muslim and Hindu ascetics had been in contact and in dialogue for a long time already by this point, and that they influenced each other. It's clear that the Sufis had adopted certain yogic practices and consider them to be legitimate religious practice. The connection with Hinduism and its ideas would continue to be a significant part of Dada's legacy from then on, and here it's important to have one of those nuancing discussions again. Firstly, and as discussed in the episode about Akbar, religious and intellectual interactions between Muslims and non-Muslims in this region was not something uncommon at this time. The perspectives on these matters by scholars at the time were significantly more nuanced than many may imagine today. We have seen that authorities engaged in translation and interpretation of significant Hindu texts like the Bhagavad Gita, for example. We see Sufi writers like Abdurrahman al-Chishti commenting on the Bhagavad Gita, theorizing that deities like Krishna and Rama were in fact prophets of God, just like Muhammad and Jesus, and that just like with Christianity or Judaism, Hinduism was originally a religion revealed by God that had gone astray. 
Thus, many saw value in some of the teachings that this tradition contained. It didn't escape people on both sides at the time that there were significant similarities between Islam, as understood through Sufism and under influence of ideas like Wahdat al-Wujud in particular, and Hindu traditions like Advaita Vedanta. Even long before Dada's time, Muslim emperors and scholars had engaged in meeting Hindu ascetics and discussing with them, considering them to hold divine wisdom, just like a Muslim saint would. One very famous example is of the Emperor Jahangir, who, on multiple occasions, met with the Hindu ascetic Chidrup, who lived in a hillside in Ujjain. Chidrup being, quote, well versed in the science of Vedanta, and Jahangir being a Muslim, they engaged in discussions where both affirmed that the same truth was being expressed in different languages, expressing an attitude that had become increasingly common at the time. Indeed, the courtier Muhammad Khan wrote that, quote, these days, the science of Vedanta is taken to mean Tasawwuf, or Sufism, indicating that many at the time saw the two traditions as essentially expressing the same divine truth. It is also important to remember that clear categories like quote-unquote Hindu, as it is used today, didn't really exist or function in the same way back then. Hindu or Hinduism is of course a term that was used by outsiders to describe groups within India, and at this time we see the term Hindu used to refer to specific groups, which is contrasted to other groups, like the Rajputs for example, who by today's standards would also be considered Hindus, but by the characterizations and identifications of the people at the time, Hindus were a sp specific group that was something else than the Rajputs for example, or uh, several other groups or identifiers at that time. Muslim scholars at the time had a nuanced view of the Hindu tradition, of course looking with some disdain towards any form of idolatry, but at the same time affirming that many so-called Hindus fell under the category of monotheists. The non-dualist school of Advaita Vedanta, or Vedanta in general, was seen as essentially monotheistic tradition, which could thus be compared and even connected to Islam in some ways. So this is important to keep in mind as we go forward. Dara Shuko, in his interactions with quote-unquote Hinduism, wasn't as unique as you might think. He followed in a tradition of interreligious dialogue that was flourishing in the region at the time. Because indeed, from this moment on, we see Dara increasingly engage more and more with other religious traditions as containing expressions of divine truth. He would study deeply some of the Hindu classics like the Ramayana and engage, much like his predecessors, with meetings and discussions with different Hindu ascetics. The most legendary of these personal interactions is Dada's frequent meetings with a Hindu sage by the name Baba Lal, who leans strongly to the non-dualist teachings of Advaita Vedanta, which teaches that the ultimate reality, or Brahman, is identical to all appearance and the individual self, or Atman. As you might expect, this attracted Dada greatly, as he could see so many similarities with the teachings of Islam, at least as he understood them through the philosophy of Wahdat al-Wujud. Baba Lal was endearingly called the shaven-headed, and Dada refers to him as, quote, one of the most perfect Gnostics. The two engaged in long debates about the different teachings of the different religions, their similarities and differences. For Dada and most of his contemporaries, Baba Lal definitely fell under the category of a monotheist, and thus could be greatly revered as a teacher of sacred wisdom, even though he wasn't a Muslim. This can be seen in Dara's next major writing, entitled Hasanat al-Arifin, Fine Words of the Gnostics, which is a collection of ecstatic utterances by various Sufi authorities. A controversial topic, these utterances have been an important part of Sufi history and expression, with the most famous example probably being Al-Halaj's exclamation, Anna al-Haq, or I am the truth. In Dara's vast collection of these utterances, meant as a kind of justification for his own Sufi ideas and claims, he also includes non-Muslims, namely Baba Lal and the famous mystic Kabir, whose status as a Muslim or non-Muslim is contested. This shows that Dara did not consider divine truth to be exclusive to Muslims, but could also be reached at least partly by practitioners of other traditions. And in the same work, he stated clearly himself, quote, in every community and in every garb, there are visible and hidden friends of the divine truth. And this idea only seems to have intensified as we reach the final years of Dara's life. 
after a military expedition in Kandahar in 1654, Dada started surrounding himself with Sanskrit scholars as well as representatives of other religions like Christianity and Judaism. Such quote-unquote Hindu scholars of Sanskrit were easy to come by as many of them were employed in the court of Shah Jahan, with whom Dada by now shared a status of almost co-emperorship. His studies into schools like Advaita Vedanta intensified as he surrounded himself with all these scholars. And all of these activities culminated in what is one of Dada's most famous works. In 1655, by now 47 years old, he wrote a treatise entitled Majma al-Bahrain, meaning the meeting place of the two oceans. As the title suggests, this is in essence a comparative work, the two oceans in the title referring to, on the surface at least, Islam and Hinduism. But remember that these categories were much more nuanced back then. Indeed, the scholar Supriya Gandhi importantly points out that, quote, the prince refers to two religious traditions, but these are not the crystallized, rigidly bounded Islam and Hinduism that we know in modern times. His project does not seek to synthesize two separate streams of Islam and Hindu religion. Instead, he aims to uncover and document a common font of truth shared by Muslim and non-Muslim Indian monotheists. The book, which was meant for a very specific elite audience close to Dada and never for the broad public, compares teachings, terms and ideas within Islam and Hinduism, showing which different terms correspond to each other and emphasizing the common ground that the traditions share. Dada himself writes in the treatise, quote, This faqir without a care, Muhammad Dada Shuku, relates that he, after discerning the truth of all truths, asserting the mysteries of the subtleties of the Sufi school of truth, and attaining this magnificent divine gift, has approached this purpose, namely to comprehend the nature of the school of thought of the monotheists of India, Muwahidani Hind, and the attainers of truth, the Muhaqiqan, among this ancient people. With some of them who have attained perfection, who have reached the extremities of ascetic practice, comprehension and understanding, and the utmost level of mystical experience, God seeking and gravity, he, in other words Dada Shuko, has had repeated encounters and carried out dialogues. And then he very clearly confirms, quote, Apart from linguistic differences in discerning and knowing, I saw no divergence. From this perspective I brought together the words of both parties and collected some terms that are essential and valuable for the seeker of truth to know and arranged them in a treatise. While, as we have seen, Dada is here taking part in an already existing tradition of interreligious dialogue, this treaty and quotes are still remarkable. It shows a huge level of clarity, comparative skill and openness to considering new ideas, while still remaining firmly grounded in his native religion of Islam, at least according to himself. The treatise is filled with quotes from and references to the Qur'an, a source that pervades the entire enterprise, while also remaining comparative in its essential nature. Quote, the project takes as its primary object of study the domain of India's knowledge, which it seeks both to describe using its own vocabulary as well as translate into Islamic, largely Sufi, categories. The Majmul Bahrain remains a huge part of Dara's legacy and is one of the most famous things that he is famous for. But he didn't stop there. During the last years of his life, Dada's translation project continued and intensified. Dada's purpose with all of these translations was his passionate attempt to try to find the most primordial and ancient truths about God's oneness, which he sought to find in these ancient Indian texts, which he saw as the most ancient of all monotheistic texts. And finally, Dada believed that he had found the ultimate example of this in one of the most ancient and important scriptures in all of the Hindu tradition, the Upanishads. A part of the larger Vedic corpus, the Upanishads are a collection of philosophically and mystically oriented texts that deal with primary subjects like the Brahman, absolute reality, and Atman, the self, as well as their relationship to each other, and which serves as the basis for the vast Hindu tradition of Vedanta. Dada was very excited by this prospect and surrounded himself with a group of Sanskrit scholars, including the brilliant Kavindracharya, to translate a select collection of Upanishads into Persian. 
Again, the prince believed that the Upanishads were texts that could unlock interpretations and secrets within the Qur'an and complement the sacred scripture of the Muslims by being the most primordial revelation sent to humankind and thus agreeing with its divine message. The Upanishads as scripture was the source of monotheism and Tawheed. Dada himself writes about the Upanishads, quote, in which are contained all the secrets of mystical path and meditative exercises of pure divine unity. He called this very ambitious collection of translated Upanishads the Sirri Akbar, or the greatest secret, which tells us something about his view of the role that the translation played. Now remember, he engages with these scriptures in this way without ever abandoning his devotion to Islam and the Qadri Sufi order. He didn't seek to replace Islam with Hindu revelation, but saw the Hindu scriptures as complements that could help Muslims and other monotheists on their path to divine unity and intimacy. Kind of similar to the way that early Muslim philosophers viewed the relationship of Islam to Greek philosophy. But of course, sometimes the contents of the Upanishads have very openly polytheistic themes, which of course can create problems for this syncretistic interpretation. What Dada's translation and commentary does here is very interesting. The text, of course, often refers to deities or gods of the Hindu pantheon like Brahma and Vishnu, and here the prince engages in some of that really fascinating comparative work, instead understanding these characters as angels rather than gods. Thus, Brahma becomes another name for the angel Jibril, Vishnu is identified with the angel Mikhail, etc. Now, this was the first translation of the Upanishads into Persian, and Dara's Sirri Akbar became a very popular and famous document, surviving beyond the years of the prince's life. Indeed, the Sirri Akbar was the first exposure that many Western scholars of Hinduism had to the Upanishads at large, and thus served as a very important factor in that field and in the history of the spread and understanding of these ancient scriptures. The prince was convinced that he had stumbled upon something very important and significant, both by bringing into light the Upanishads to a Persian audience, and thereby opening it up for further discussion about the shared features and truths of different expressions of monotheism or divine oneness. But these fortunes were short-lived, unfortunately, as Dada's life was just about to be turned completely upside down. Well, his life was about to end. Indeed, when the emperor Shah Jahan suddenly fell gravely ill, a bloody war of succession broke out between his sons, and in particular, very intense fighting took place between Dara Shuko and his younger brother Aurangzeb. Perhaps due to the relative military inexperience on Dara's part, or probably other circumstantial factors, Aurangzeb soon got the upper hand. He forced Dara and his family and supporters to flee across India and crowned himself the new emperor under the title of Alamgir, or the World Caesar. Soon Dada and his family were captured, and Aurangzeb very quickly realized that the prince, his older brother, was quite popular. He was very popular with the general population, both Muslims and non-Muslims, and this was of course a huge threat to his new authority. And this is what leads us to that very tragic end of our story, when Aurangzeb has his brother Dada Shuku executed. This is a very famous story, told and retold across history, and it often is given very religious undertones and themes. Aurangzeb is the orthodox puritanical Muslim who executes his liberal and open-minded brother Dada. But this, of course, as you might imagine, is quite a modern and anachronistic way of looking at this situation. Indeed, Aurangzeb does use religious language in justifying his execution of his brother and during the War of Succession, but it's never clear what this heresy is supposed to be. Instead, all claims, references to Dada's supposed heretical doctrines and engagement with Hindus and so on really come after he was already executed, probably as a way to justify what was essentially a political decision after the fact. Because history would indeed remember these two brothers in very different ways. Aurangzeb is a very controversial figure. Some say he is the most hated man in Indian history. 
Under his leadership, the Mughal Empire reached its peak in terms of territorial expanse, but many also claim that his rulership was the beginning of the end, and that he was a tyrannical, oppressive ruler. The way Aurangzeb is remembered is often as a champion of a more quote-unquote orthodox or conservative puritanical Islam, in contrast to other Mughal royals like Dara or his predecessors like Akbar. For those Muslims who like that kind of stuff, this is a positive thing, but for others it is a great tragedy. But how accurate is this common portrayal? How different was Aurangzeb and Dara really? As you might guess, it's a big oversimplification and mistake to make a clear dichotomy between Aurangzeb as representing quote-unquote orthodox Islam and Dara on the other side of the spectrum. Not only because the two weren't all that different in terms of their religious beliefs and affiliations, but also because such a one-sided view fails to take the nuance of this context into consideration. Dara Shuko considered himself to be a truly orthodox Muslim, and his teachings and ideas very much represented major movements within Islam at that time. He, as a Qadri Sufi, did not stand in opposition to some orthodox school of scholars. As we saw earlier, this kind of division didn't exist back then. For many fellow Muslims and scholars at the time, Dara's activities were entirely legitimate. And Aurangzeb, after all, wasn't all that different. He too was deeply involved with Sufism, was devoted to the Chishti saints, for example. Many of those Muslims today who admire Aurangzeb as a defender of true faith would probably not be very happy with a lot of his perspectives on Islam. We shouldn't see the conflict between the two brothers as one between orthodox Islam and unorthodox Islam, and definitely not as between orthodox Islam and Sufism, because indeed the, the word orthodoxy is always a relative and fluid term, defined by those who claim to be following it and changing with time and place. A more helpful way to understand the situation is as a conflict between different understandings of Islam, rather than between Islam and its opposite. If we do the latter, then Islam itself becomes the problem, because we are defining it as such that the more Muslim one is, the bigger the problem. Aurangzeb was more puritanical because he was more Muslim, more religious than Dara, but this is simply not the case. Arguably, in some ways, Dara was more religious than Aurangzeb, more devoted to Islam than his younger brother, but at the end of the day, th these terms aren't useful at all. The two brothers simply understood the boundaries of their religion differently. But even all of this is supposing that Aurangzeb was indeed dramatically different from Dara in doctrine, which isn't all that accurate either. Now you can't deny that Aurangzeb does come off as a somewhat more strict and rigid compared to his predecessors. He styled himself as a strictly Islamic ruler, did things like forbid music in court, at least for a period, re-established the jizya tax, he had several Hindu temples destroyed, etc. There's a lot more nuance to this discussion itself, but that will have to wait for another thorough discussion of Aurangzeb's rule in particular. But he isn't as different as many tend to believe. Many like to speculate about what India would have been like if Dara had won the war of succession and become the emperor. Honestly, probably not all that different. Dara was also from the same environment, it's highly likely that he would have had Aurangzeb killed if he had got the upper hand instead, and the realities of rulership would have probably led him down similar paths. Bottom line is, we should do our best to avoid the common black and white narratives about this topic. It is simply not the case that Aurangzeb was universally considered more orthodox or more Islamic. It is simply not the case that Aurangzeb had the backing of the religious Islamic scholars while being hated by Hindus, and that Dara, being despised by the Islamic scholars and liked by the Hindu population. When we look at the armies of the two brothers during the War of Succession and their general supporters at this time, we find even numbers between them. Dada had just as many Muslims and Muslim scholars who supported his side as Aurangzeb did, and they both had an equal amount of Hindus who strongly supported their claim to the throne. Clearly things aren't so simple, and history has often projected later construction onto a context that simply doesn't work that way. The way we conceive these events and the status of these different figures says more about us and our own environment than it does about the historical period and people we are actually describing. History is never black or white, and this is no exception. Both Dara Shuko and Aurangzeb are men of their times. 
Dada in his exploration and interactions with various strands of Indic thought as an extension of his Sufi piety and Muslim devotedness embodied attitudes and movements in the religious environment of his time. In some ways he isn't all that unique, but in other ways he's of course incredibly fascinating. He may strike us as an unusual kind of Muslim intellectual, judging by today's standards and the way that the religious landscape of India looks at the current moment, but at the time that he lived, his approach to religion and religious diversity represented one way of understanding Islam, Sufism, and our quest for divine unity. One way among many that have existed in the long history of Islam and the world religions. I hope you found this to be an interesting overview of Dara Shuko's life and teachings. If you want a more uh, thorough look into these subjects, I highly recommend a recent book uh, written by the scholar Supriya Gandhi entitled The Emperor Who Never Was. This is one of the primary sources I have used for this video. This book is really the only proper overview or biography of Dara and his ideas, and I can't recommend this book enough. It straddles the boundaries between being incredibly readable and interesting and engaging, while at the same time being deeply uh, scholarly and very competently written from that perspective too. So check out this book if you are interested more in this subject. Um, if you want to support this channel and its attempts to give you uh, free content about the world's different religious traditions, then consider supporting us on Patreon or through a one-time donation on PayPal. And I, of course, also highly appreciate you, everyone who likes, subscribes, and comments on these videos. Thank you so much, and I will see you next time. Special shout out to my new saints, Suhail Gukal and Mary Carmen Ordones. And of course, a thank you to all of my patrons who make this channel possible.